Okay, here we go. Hello, everybody. In, uh, okay, here we go. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators. We've all worked for just about every major publisher in the business. We've together published probably somewhere around 100 books, and we've all taught illustration at the university. Each week we come up with a different topic in illustration. Sometimes we agree, most of the time we fight, but each time you're going to come away with something brand spanking new. That's right. Like this time. So <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so this uh, this uh, week what we thought we'd do is like in past weeks is answer a few questions uh, that we've been getting in our mailbag. And uh, just a reminder, if you do have a question for the show, uh, go to svslearn.com, click on the podcast link in the, uh, in the, wherever the buttons are. What's it called? <laughs> Very smooth. Yeah. Very smooth. I was, I was so good up until I, know. I forgot what the thing is. You know where to press click. In the, press in the button. Yeah, you know, Anyways, the thing. you're going to click on podcast and the podcast is going to go up. You're going to see all the old episodes and you're going to click on, you're going to see a little thing that says, ask a question. And you click on that, and then there's a form you fill out. And your question gets filled out, and through the magic of the internet and technology, that question comes to our um, to our mailbox. And we open the letter, and we read it, and we answer it, and we try to get to as many of these questions as we can in episodes so we don't get too behind. But, man, those mm-hmm. questions are piling up, but they're all so good. So we appreciate you guys asking us. Lee, take it away. What's our first question for today? First question sort of takes me to task, so I thought we'd lead off the episode with that. Okay. Um, there's a couple, got a couple of emails, so I'm going to paraphrase here uh, on those those few emails and questions. Um, a few people are upset with me because I'm doing a tarot deck, and I don't know about the world of tarot, and they're thinking that I'm sort of capitalizing on what is hot at the moment, or basically doing a cash grab. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I wanted to so ask you guys about how much, that. I wanted how to much cash to that. have you grabbed? I'm almost at a million dollars so far. <laughs> oh, no, and I haven't even haven't even launched yet. People are just <laughs> sending me money <laughs> because you've talked about making a tarot deck. I talked about it, and they were like, "You know what? That's pr- that's hot." And then they sent me a bunch of money. So thank you guys. No, no, no. Um, I'm still in the research and development phase of it, but I did. I guess I would start answering this question with, um, or this this problem with. Uh, people should check out the episode of our podcast where we talked about um, either it's a yes or it's a hell no. I mean, there's there's no time that I. Th- I mean, I'm just going to sort of speak for you guys because I think you'd agree with me here. That we take a project that is just cash based that we literally don't care anything about. Um, for me, when I'm looking for a project, I'm looking for something that is interesting that I haven't illustrated before because I want to keep illustrating the same books and the same kinds of things, uh, and some, something that's interesting. And, and what really drew me to the tarot deck, I wasn't thinking about the tarot deck originally. I started doing research because I am a business, and if I don't make money doing it, I'm, I can't pay my bills. <laughs> and so mm-hmm. I need to have a commercially viable project. So that's that's like step one. And then I have to combine that with something that I'm personally passionate about as an artist as well. And so the thing that I was looking for with that the tarot deck filled was I was looking for a narrative based project where the subject matter is open and the images aren't sequential. So that's a very, very tough ask, especially Mm -hmm. if you come from children's books like I do, Mm -hmm. where you're doing 32 pages, you're moving a character through these pages and things are happening. I love children's books. The one thing that, um, that they don't do is like you can't take every image from a children's book and then hang it on the wall as art because it 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 serves as a narrative. It has to be within the context of the story right. uh, most of the time. And so you know, I was looking for a project that was going to enable me to do images that I really like, add a narrative twist to it, and then have you know a standalone print or or I'm really interested in patterns. And so can I take some elements of the, the tarot deck and turn it into a pattern and and you know so so just different ways to use imagery and then so once I once I stumbled onto the tarot deck and the narrative possibilities uh, just really intrigued me and so so I'm super interested in the subject matter uh, and and it checked off all the boxes 
And the fact that it's going to be commercially viable as well is an important element. And so kind of it all lined up uh, for me to say, hey, I'm going to do that. Um, Mm -hmm. I've had other things in the past that I've researched that I've kind of gotten into. And one element of it, you know, becomes a hurdle that you can't get over. And you just say, okay, that's not going to be a good project for me. Mm -hmm. So what do you guys think? I got to take this. I got. I got to. I got to let everybody know that anybody who, who says, who tries to pull rank and say you don't belong, in this, you know, illustrating in this uh, genre, is, is wrong, in my opinion. No gatekeeping. Is that what you're saying? No. Yeah. And the thing is, it's a very few people that do it, and we tend to listen to people that are loud, and we tend to self-edit. You know, so I've had students say, well, I don't know if I can work in this project because this isn't my field or this isn't at what point am I allowed to do this? And and I'm like, you know, the way that I operate is it's a you're you're free to do whatever you want to do. The the problem comes in when you don't know about um, a specific genre that you want to illustrate about and. You, you, you know, we've all seen illustrations where, you know, it, someone does a civil war piece or something and the, they have the wrong weapon or the wrong kind of uh, ammo bag or the wrong kind of <clears throat> whatever for the era. Wrong. And, and, and so it is offensive to the people who know about that. Mm-hmm. Now, there are, I would say in, in most publications, there's the, most projects the person who's going to be offended and, and going to say, well, that's not right for this genre. They're probably the 1% usually if it's not a, not horribly done. Mm-hmm. So whereas, you know, 99% of the people looking at that illustration are happy. There's 1% that are going to stick their hand up and they're going to start crying and, and making all kinds of noise. And so then the, the artists are like, well, I don't know if I belong in that, in that genre. And, and I would just say, in general, you you want to make sure that you're um, you're well enough researched so that you you hit everybody and everybody's happy in in a, mm-hmm. in a perfect world. Right. But I wouldn't well, worry that, about that, the. You got to reach out to people too. You can't operate in a void, like Will said. I mean, you, we're we're born not knowing anything, right? Right. So if that's the criteria, I couldn't ever illustrate anything. I You'd have never to be learn. Able to illustrate I'm anything, always a beginner yeah. at something, right? Until you become. Uh, you know, a novice and then an uh, advanced person in, in some certain field. But what what the, the tarot decks enabled me to do is to reach out to people who do know. You know, I always think about actors and they go on a movie set and, you know, if somebody's got to be in a martial arts film, say, for example, they got to learn martial arts. Well, they bring in the martial arts expert to kind of show them how to do it. And that's kind of what I'm doing with the tarot mm-hmm. deck. I reach out to a few people who are in that world, who, who are respected in that world, and they are giving me feedback because I don't know the things that are essential. Like Will was saying, did I leave off something that was important on a certain card. So I want to know what those things are that have to be on a card or, or, and, and where can I have artistic license mm-hmm. to? And mm-hmm. hopefully it's the kind of the melding of those two, two things. But that's, what's interesting about a project is, is, is learning about all this stuff. I mean, can you imagine if we didn't get to do that phase, the, like the research and development phase is probably my favorite part of any project. Right. Well, and that, that's the key there. And, and I, you know, I don't want to muddy the water too much, but, but, there's fandoms on one side. Will's talking about genres on one on another side. There's culture on the other side. And there's a difference between appropriating and appreciating. And and I think appropriation is when you take something and exploit it. Uh, and you're just you're just either using it to advance yourself, to uh, to make a quick buck. Or to um, you know not fully understanding the thing that you're you're appropriating, but when you get in and you do the research and you talk to people part of that community or part of that culture or part of that fandom, and you learn about it and you start to become um, I guess educated in, in what's important to those people who people are really part of it, you may even become um, you know to this point where you can show appreciation to it because you know which lines to cross, which lines not to cross, which areas to, um, I guess, which areas to amplify and which mm-hmm. areas where, you know, like, like Will was saying, like, 
you don't want to take a wrong step or do something that could be offensive because you just didn't understand it. But by doing your homework and by doing your research, I think about like, you know, um, uh, can a, can a non, I'm going to bring up religion. You guys ready for this? <laughs> Please don't Jake. <laughs> no, scary. but could a, could a non-Christian illustrate a Bible and, and would that be bad and, and offensive? I would not take offense. I, I'm a Christian. I, I, have read the Bible, and I have Bible books for the kids, right? I don't do my research and see if those artists are <laughs> Christian or not who did it. Mm-hmm. I just want a cool illustrated um, version of the Bible, you know, to, to give my kids, right? To play devil's advocate beyond that, if someone says they are a Christian, you don't know what's in their heart. They might yeah. not be, <laughs> they right? Might, but they, they say they be. are, so now you're okay with it? It's like we but, should stay out of each other's heads, I think. I exactly. And the thing is what what would upset me if I open up that illustrated version of the Bible and I see something that clearly is not you know something found in the Bible or something that they just sort of messed it up and 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 is obviously this you know this person didn't understand what they were illustrating. Mm-hmm. That would be you know that would be more upsetting and I wouldn't I wouldn't take that that you know I wouldn't you know, purchase that thing or take that thing serious. So, um, but but as regards to what's in their head or or where do they come from, as long as it's like being done respectfully and being done in a way of appreciation, I I think I think it should be okay, right? I mean, I think so. I would. I mean, I I know for a fact. So when I did my uh, you know little hero characters for for comic conventions, mm-hmm. I made so many people happy. I probably mm-hmm. pissed off some people because I, there were genres that and fandoms that I got into that I didn't, I didn't watch the shows, I didn't watch any part of it, didn't know about them, but I paid um, people who did for their ideas for what I should do. So in other words, I, I, you know, I approached a friend and said, "You're really into watching this show. What would you do for this character in my style? Like, what would be your idea?" And then I took those ideas, I paid for them, and then I took those ideas and I created them and made a lot of people. People would come up to me and like, oh my gosh, and they'd gush about the show. And I'm sitting there going, I have no idea what you're talking about. And a lot of times, if the conversation went far enough, I would say, you know, I didn't, I'm not into that show, but so many people wanted me to do that character that I paid for an idea. And it opened up a whole new conversation. And then they would say, well, you really should watch it because it's amazing, you know? And so those people were happy. But there were probably other people who are, I don't know, I, I would call them busybodies who were like, well, Will shouldn't have been doing those those characters because he didn't earn the right to do it because he didn't watch the show. In my world, I call baloney on that. I, I do what I want, and I don't worry about yeah. it. If someone else doesn't Somebody's like... Somebody's always going to be mad, right? Yeah, I mean, if someone else doesn't like the fact that I did that, I don't care. I with really fandoms, don't. I, <laughs> with fandoms, it's there's such a... Um, a, a spectrum of 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 how you know how much of a fan you are, mm-hmm. and I think if you like uh, you know something not too obscure but somewhat obscure would be like Neon Genesis Evangelion, right? It's this anime that's been you know going on for twenty plus years, maybe more, twenty five years, and it has really cool robots. I think those robots are or they're not even ro- they're like this weird giant mech slash creature thing. Anyways, I only watched one of the series, but there's multiple series. There's multiple movies. I haven't watched them all, but um, because I haven't watched them all, do, does that mean I don't, I can't do Neon Genesis Evangelion fan art because I only watched one of the series. And then perhaps Will sees these cool robots and he wants to do some fan art of it, but he hasn't watched a single episode. Does he have no right <laughs> to do that? I don't think so. If you think it looks cool and you want to um, show some appreciation and add to it, and you know that the fans who love that thing are going to love the thing that you're creating, mm-hmm. then I think that that's that's really and that's you're the in a good bottom spot. Yeah, that's the bottom line for me. I had so many people that came up to me and like, I want that. I love it. You nailed it. And I, I don't know why I nailed it because I didn't watch the, the show. They bought mm-hmm. it. They went home happy. Mm-hmm. So is that bad that someone went home like 
completely. Yeah, I mean, you're, yeah, th- people always have the the ability to just not buy what you're selling. I bring up a, an example too of this whole thing, like you know, with my the Batman that I did last year, which I've now done a couple of kind of comic book char- characters. I don't come from that world at all, and uh, Jake had challenged me to do it, and we talked about it on this podcast before. Um, then there's some things I left off. I'm not a Batman connoisseur. So, uh, so I don't know the intricacies of all the different versions of Batman. Like I remember Jake saying something about, um, somebody who did a Batman character and had the little spiky, are they gloves, Jake? Where, no, I mean, is that part of his gloves? Or? Like board yeah, bracers, like our, right? <laughs> the what? They're what? Board, board bracers? Something like that. They're the spikes yeah. that come out of his forearm, right? Yeah. Are those on the glove? So I, I did not put those on my character. Am I in trouble because of that? No, I, I don't care. If you like the Batman that I did, that's fine. If you don't like you're the Batman with I did because I left. You're in trouble with me as a Batman fan. You're, yeah, you're in trouble with some people. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna but if you can fight, <laughs> if you if you can handle yourself, then you're all right. <laughs> yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay fighting. I'm okay fighting. Um, I'm a low detail kind of guy. I don't like overly detailed characters. So I, I do my version of the things that I'm interested in. But I the, the big thing that I'll add here is I just don't paint what I'm not interested in. Mm-hmm. I don't do it at all. And so mm-hmm. I'm, I'm painting something. I'm interested in it. That's how you know that I'm interested in it is because I'm spending time doing it. Yeah. And that's yeah. my only criteria. I, I personally am a fan. I think culture is improved when things get mixed up. Um, when someone who's not a fan does, you know, in a fan, in a fandom, when someone who's not a fan comes in and can see it with fresh eyes and do something a little different, that like, that I think enriches that fan base. And I, it's the same, I think with culture too, like, like you rap, rap culture, right? Like, (laughs) don't shake your head, Lee. I'm serious. Could, (laughs) should Eminem not have been a rapper? Because he's white. No, he's one of the greatest rappers, right? And it's not that he appropriated rap culture and became, you know, and like stole it from them. He added to it and and it's better because of it, you know? So let me uh, ask you guys a question. This is a little little sidetrack here, but let me ask you guys a question. This should be fun. Is there anything, you know, we're fans of different things. Is there anything you guys see that you're a fan of that when somebody messes up, it sort of bugs you? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Um, And this is an opinion thing. I don't know if it's actually messed up, but I see uh, one of the Hollywood tropes is the, the, the standoff. It used to be called, it would be completely culturally wrong for me to say this, but it's a country, the blank standoff, right? With guns pointed at each other. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about, right? And I don't, and 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 the reason for that like is like at a western, or? yeah, or any. Oh, it could be anything, any show where there's guns that come out, right? It could be a cop show, and they they stand there pointing their guns at each other, and no one fires. And I'm mm-hmm. like, if someone is pointing a loaded gun at you, threatening to shoot you, and you have a loaded gun, and you're threatening to shoot them, and then so a lot of times there's a third and a fourth person in there too, and they're all threatening each other to shoot each other. The guns yeah. are going to go off. They're not going to just talk. And they and so many times, it, it ends peacefully. And I'm like, I call bullcrap on that. <laughs> no that's so way. Funny that that's what comes to your mind immediately. With this, the with the rev- <laughs> reservoir dogs scene. Will is that what you're talking it's about? It's in every but... movie that ever had a gun. It's like this this love affair that Hollywood has with this peaceful Stand resolution off. when loaded so, guns with fingers on triggers. You know where triggers. that came from? You know where that came from? Because I, I was reading up on this a little bit. Oh, so really? Reservoir Dogs was the first Western film to have that that standoff. That there's an actual name. for When you it say that Western, I, that, you mean you don't. I mean, mean genre Western. You mean no, I don't Western mean the genre. Geographical I mean, Western, right? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So Reservoir Dogs was the first one. Quentin Tarantino, huge fan of all kinds of films, specifically Japanese film. There's a Japanese detective film mm-hmm. that had that, and he was paying homage or stealing from it who knows but he put it in his film and then you start seeing it show up in all these other these other things but you do have it in you know that's a good point you do have it in the good the bad the ugly at the end there a (laughs) three-way standoff Uh uh-huh you know um 
Anyways, well, that I makes that, sense. They hadn't drawn yet. I think what Lee's asking, though, that's true. They haven't drawn yet in that one. But I think what yeah. Lee's asking is not so much what is an unrealistic scenario in a movie. He's saying, "What are you a fan of that that like, they get a detail I, wrong? That they get a detail like you're I'll not. Give a, you, I'll give you an example. I'll give you. An Will, example. I don't I put Will in like. Are you a fan of like standoffs? Just a huge fan of standoffs. <laughs> doesn't care. I'm, all about I'm a fan of movies, and I'm offended the when they put that in there. But yeah, I see what you're saying. Your, if you draw a gun near Will, you are going to get shot. That's what you need to know <laughs> about it. There's no standoff if you get near Will. Um, okay, so I'm I'm a lifelong skateboarder, and I know about it. I mean, I've done it, and I've watched it, and uh, I mean at the comp- competitive uh, amateur level, and I've watched a bunch of pro stuff too. I've done it my whole life, and so. When I see there's this, there's this, you know skateboarders when they go uh, off a ramp or 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 up into the air, typically they grab in some way. They grab the board, right? Mm-hmm. There's one grab in particular where they reach down with their back hand and it's between the feet. It's called mm-hmm. it's 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 insultingly called stink bug. Nobody mm-hmm. ever does it intentionally. It's mm-hmm. a super beginner kind of grab, and it's really really ugly. Um, and so anybody who's been in skateboarding just knows if somebody grabs it like that, they're like, oh, man, I got guy grab stink bug. It's like the worst thing you could do. And But I see illustrators and I see commercial projects with skateboarders and then they're grabbing stink bug. And I know that, that they don't know what they they're doing. They don't skate. And, and I, but I know 99.9% of the planet does not care about that at all. It's a skateboarder. They're up in the right. air. They're grabbing the board. There's no difference. But for me, because I know that how the body should be I'll, positioned like that, it just b- bothers me. I'll give you one racquetball so i played racquetball for the last 35 years and in movies when they have someone playing racquetball they have two guys or two you know two people playing racquetball they just are slamming that ball they're hitting it as however they can get to it they're just hitting it and for anybody that plays if you just hit the ball you're going to create what they call a setup for me for the your opponent and and it's the end because you've given me the whole point of racquetball is to keep the other guy off balance and to not let him get a setup, an easy shot where you can kill it. And so every single shot that they're hitting in movies is a setup. And I'm like, so they don't play. So they're there's my right, yeah. right. Okay. That's perfect. But I also give them, I realize that everyone else watching that movie has no idea. They're just playing racquetball. Like, wow, you know, they're, that's, that's right, a backdrop. Right, right. Yeah, you know, something. I'll tell you mine. <laughs> you ready for this? I'm it's going to be Wars. super specific. I'm, I can't wait. I'm a Star for this. Wars fan, right? <laughs> did you guys watch Mandalorian season two? Yes. Negative. You guys, did, am I going to spoil it if I start talking about it? No. Okay, good. But it is so, spoiler alert for those listening. I spoiler guess. alert. Turn it off. I'm going to talk about the season finale of Mandalorian season two, and. What happens is, so Mandalorian takes place nine years after the Battle of Yavin. So essentially six years after the battle uh, or the, the events of Return of the Jedi, right? <laughs> Quit yawning, Will. <laughs> what we know... We really deep already. In what we know sentence, from, <laughs> from the new trilogy is that Luke started his uh, Jedi Academy, his, his Jedi thing, that he his, his dojo or whatever it is. He started that with Ben, his nephew, right? Leia's, Leia and Han's kid. Apparently that was like his first protege. But at the end, and, and, and if Ben was, you know, Ben would be too young for him to have started that at the end of season nine, yet he's taking baby Yoda or Grogu to go train him at a non-existent academy. So they totally... Either they messed up the timeline, I doubt that they would mess it knowing who's who's in charge there, or they are re um, they're redoing something. They're 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 negating this this new trilogy or something. So it's little things like that. You know, Star Wars. Did you spot um, that in me? Like while you're watching it, you're like, hey, wait, what? And you like, yeah, I was trying to. Something's not adding up right here. If this takes place, <laughs> then he's taking him. Then how? The other thing that that gets me too is they don't really. Sometimes they mess this up in the movies, but it happens all the time in the comics. Is in the Star Wars comics is messing up the size of spaceships, and and thinking they're either bigger or smaller. And I'm just like, you guys got to stay consistent with that. A Tie Fighter is not that big, or it's not that small, or and whatnot. So yeah. 
that's a that's a good that's, example. I mean, that's that's actually really perfect. Um, because you definitely know about that that genre. You know all the details from it. I, mm-hmm. When I watch it, I would have never put that together. I mean, <laughs> right. in a million years. <laughs> yes, that's pretty good. So I don't know. I like are we ready to wrap this one up? I think we've uh, we've explored it. We argued about it. We agreed on it. And now we're going to move on. <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> All right. Hello. Uh, my name is Ricard. I hope I'm saying that correct. Um, I'm from Sweden. And this, if this message is a bit wonky, I started SVS this past year. Wait, so if far, he's from I'm, if he's from Sweden, it's not Ricard. It's <laughs> that's that's uh, south of the border. It's Jean Luc Ricard. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry to interrupt. Go for Ricard. it. Ricard. Is there a better way to say it? you say it? How did you say his name? I would say Ricard. Richard. Richard. I feel like that A needs to be drawn out a little bit. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> They, he joined uh, SVS last year. That's the the school um, that sponsors this whole podcast. Ton of drawing classes there. Um, he says he's done the first four basic lessons. I'm not sure if that's classes or lessons, but um, he's done most of the exercises. Um, now I had warmed up with a lot of the basic exercises to get back to drawing at the end of last year, but still felt it was important to do them. My question is, I think you all put quite a lot of focus on not trying to be completely correct, but to make more reasonable guesses when doing the basics exercises to make it look more believable. I like that, um, but as a student, I think it can be a bit misleading, as you guys have probably made a lot of boring still lifes and technical drawings with a focus on getting things correct. It's boring to do, but that's what makes you then be able to make reasonable guesses. Um, which does make sense. I agree with that. Um, It would have been fun to hear you guys talk about these types of basic exercises like still life of, uh, you know, um, geometric shapes or trying to master perspective like Scott Robertson. If you guys don't know who Scott Robertson is, you should check him out. He's amazing. Um, How important are they, the basic exercises? That's one of his questions. Um, Here's a long email. I'm worried that we're going to get lost on what the actual question Mm. is. Um, basically he's saying, do you go through the pains of doing a perfect, you know, perspective, two point perspective drawing, say for example, or do you sort of wing it to make it look good enough and then move on? What do you guys Mm -hmm. think? Mm -hmm. You know, I have worked with, with students and a, a lot and, um, we're not all the same. And, and so, and, and, um. You know, maybe I should, well, I was going to break it down with, with like learning to snowboard. There's different, there's different ways to learn to snowboard and they just, some people cannot get it with some of the methods and they respond to others right away. And the same is true, I think, for, for drawing in that, um, that method of, of, of showing people the, you know, cause I have the class visualizing drawing and perspective and. And that worked for me when when someone said it doesn't have to be precise because you know I learned with the with the with the ruler the long you know the straight edge drawing out the vanishing points and being as technically accurate as possible and there's uh, something happens I think at least for me where there was a disconnect it was so technical and so precise that I wasn't really able to to look at something and, and draw it the same way at first until someone kind of gave me permission and said, you know, as long as those vanishing points are going kind of close, it's going to look okay. And the, and, and once I was given that permission, boy, it just took off. And then I was able to just manipulate perspective the way I wanted and, and to exaggerate it and have fun with it. That worked for me. But I had a student one time that was like, I do not get what you're doing and how you can just create an environment from scratch. I cannot do that. And I started breaking it down. I'm like, okay, well, in general, if the camera, if you're trying to show something, you know, where you're, where you're looking down on the earth or looking from a higher perspective, your horizon line is going to be high. And if you're, the camera's low and you're down on the ground more, your horizon line is going to be low. So if you just start there, just Mm -hmm. whack it in there, you know, high or low or in the middle, and we'll start there. And I started building up from there. And at the end of this this tutorial, I was giving him on a Zoom call. 
He's like, yeah, I don't get it at all. I, I don't, I don't know where to start. I have a blank piece of paper and I don't know where to start. So something wasn't getting through Mm -hmm. and he seemed like a really intelligent guy. Mm -hmm. So my only conclusion there is that just the method that I was using just wasn't working for him. You know, some people cannot, and I I know a, a handful of artists are this way as well. They cannot see anything in their mind. They can't uh-huh. close their eyes and see the thing that they're going to draw. Mm-hmm. Or and, and every artist is a little different. Some are more fuzzy, some are very crisp. I'm sure King Jung G Kim Jung G G <laughs> how we pronounce G. Kim Jung G, who can just look at a blank piece of paper and draw a masterpiece, you know, in a couple hours with like 30 characters in three point perspective, <laughs> you know, driving vehicles and robots. Uh, he probably has such clarity in his mind that he could just, you know, probably do it with his eyes closed. But then on the other end of the spectrum, there's people who are just can understand things abstractly and not, you know, it's not solid. And so, um, I think to, to bring it back to, to, well, to your student, Will, you know, that it could be that it's, 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 they have to start drawing and sketching on the paper to find the thing that they want to do. And then once it's there, they can work with, with the material that's down there, but to answer Ricard's or Ricard's whatever, his, <laughs> Ricard's question is the, the reason, um, our fundamentals uh, um, are are the way that they are. Is this is an approach for illustration and how to find your way into um, doing that illustrative style where it doesn't necessarily need to be hyper realistic. It just needs to be believable. Um, perspective needs to be practical and not necessarily like um, exact, right? Um, uh, building with basic shapes and adding and subtracting shapes, light and shadow, all those things, um, we teach it in a way that um, that ideally you could go on and and create an illustration, you know, from your head, based on on these things. Not necessarily needing to look at reference, not needing photo reference. The whole purpose of this is, and with illustration, I think, is to make things that don't exist. And, and give them some sort of life. And so that's that's our approach. That's the way we do it. There's, you know, a hundred other people that teach it differently. And our recommendation is, is honestly, take a little bit from all these and find the one that really works for you and resonates with you and, and lean into that. And whatever gives you the, the best results, that's the thing you should you should do. So we're not saying SVS is the end all be all for everyone, and and no other you know way to learn or or, or you know other art school out there is is worthless, and, and this is the only place. We're just this is our approach, and hopefully it, it works for people. I should add too that it's a, it's a base. There's different levels of classes, and. The first class, you know, what he's talking about, the perspective class, is one of the first four. We put our first four classes as being the most important thing when you just show up at the door. We don't know what people are coming with and what classes Mm -hmm. they've had before. We put the first four right there at the doorway, and we don't want to create a wall for you. Um, In other words, you come to the classes, and all of a sudden, we go super technical, with mm-hmm. something right in the beginning, it could throw a lot of people. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of people are really nervous about perspective. They feel insecure about it. And uh, and there's just so much, I don't wanna say math, because it's not adding or anything like that, um, geometry maybe, but there's just so much to getting it truly accurate that doesn't actually help the picture. Um, so we do have an advanced perspective class that actually is being built right now that's going to add a little bit more specificity to that knowledge, but you start out, you know, I, I think of think of it like a, an exercise program, for example. If somebody just shows up at the gym for the first day, you're not gonna overload them with this huge barbell of weight, right? On their first mm-hmm. day, you're gonna give them some easy exercises to get into it, to sort of understand what they're doing, and later you, you start adding that um, difficulty. So there's different levels of, of, of where you're at as a student, too, and what you're ready for. A lot of people, when they first get ready for a perspective or these technical classes, don't really need that level 
at some point, maybe you do. Cool. All right, you want to do the next question? Yeah, let's go. This is from Deborah. Uh, this is Studio Setup Strategies. Um, what is your current art studio setup? How does it compare to your studio workplace as a student and your studio as a beginning professional? Um, if you have thoughts on the following question, that would be awesome. But the previous one is the main one. What suggestions do you have to keep me tidy, organized, inspired, consistent? <laughs> just tack on this really difficult to answer question. Um, when I'm primary, when I am a primary care, when I am primarily a caregiver and will be interrupted by children, yada yada yada. So how do you deal with that in your workspace? That's a way to relate it. Mm. Um, so our current art studio setup. Any tips um, that we can bring? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to this first. Um, so I remember um, back when, <laughs> before I ever had a full studio to myself, I had a kitchen table and I kept all my art supplies in like bags and boxes and I kept them in a closet. And when it was time to create, usually at night after I got home from work, I would come in, kids put the kids to bed and then I would set up my space on the kitchen table. I'd work there for a few hours and then I'd clean it all up and put it away. And it got the job done. Um, but it was yeah, it was frustrating to have to do the setup and takedown when I only had a limited amount of time. So um, what really helped was having um, we right after that situation, we were in an apartment, we moved into a house. And I was able to get a room in that house just for the studio. It was the smallest room in the house. And I was able to just have a setup the whole time. So the way that I, and, and then that setup has grown over the years. And essentially what I created there is what I have used, a system is what I've used ever since. And that is, I keep my, um, I keep my digital side separate from my traditional side. And the reason for that is I don't want to be distracted by the computer when I'm doing traditional. Um, I don't want to be sucked into whatever it is that, that you know, email, um, communicating, websites, all that stuff. I, I just don't want that interfering while I'm working traditionally. And then consequently, when I'm working digitally, um, uh, you know, that space is dedicated to that. And I, and I try to do my best to, to not be distracted there. So I always have those two things separate, uh, you know, back to back or, or side to side, just so that they're not happening together. And then um, I, I don't know if Ikea still sells them, but there's these Ikea flat files that are affordable and just perfect for keeping art supplies organized. And I actually bought the Ikea silverware um trays for you know forks and knives and i use that for different uh, markers and pens and, and pencils and they fit perfectly into those um into those flat files um and that's that's really uh you know one of the best ways the the, the flat files also have rollers on the bottom wheels so you can keep them away out of the out of the corner and then when it's time to work you just roll them to your station and do it and so that's uh, that's essentially what what I would do. I also would get a um, a folding um, uh, like panel artboard so that you don't draw flat or you don't create flat, but that you can, can create at an angle. Um, and that always helps with the um, you know back pain or neck pain or or just posture in general. Um, and those things, you know, you can fold them up and, and put them away when needed. So that's, that's sort of my thoughts there and my advice on, on what you do, what you can that's do. Pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. Will is a perfect, in a perfect place to address this because he has just <laughs> got his studio set up and he's sort of make and do, um, Will. Well, I'm, yeah, so I am in a little tiny office right now it's like a it's it's more than a closet but it's not as big as a bedroom um it's and like shed size kind it's of, like a shed right? it's like yeah what's it's your like square a, footage i mean like in terms of dimension for this rectangle you're in what the would room is eight feet wide and 
probably 12 feet, probably eight by 12. Mm. It's really tiny. Yeah. Uh, and, and so what we did was um, I wanted to be debt free for the first time in my life, including my house. So we just moved to Arizona for other reasons. I did. Some people are like, you moved to be near Jake. I'm like, I like Jake, <laughs> I like him a lot, but I wouldn't have moved to Arizona for Jake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I moved because my wife, uh, her, some of her family lives down here. She really wanted to be close to, to mom, and it was a good time to do it. There's, there's a lot of other factors and reasons and, and stuff. So, but anyway, we downsized into this really small house. It's a, it's, it's weird. It's in a little resort community, and it's got a place for our, our camper to go under, right next to the house, under a special. Um, uh, awning roof, type awning thing. for the camper with hookups and everything so you can you can have company stay in your camper while you live in your house or vice you know whatever um and and so uh but with that it was a challenge in space and now one of the advantages that i have is i don't have any small kids at home anymore i i remember i i had a um at one point in one of our apartments that we lived in i did make my office in the walk-in closet in our master bedroom mm -hmm. so we had a, a two-bedroom apartment and it had a a walk-in closet and that was where i set up my my office and that's where my oldest son who was three at the time got into my paints and painted on his tongue with my with cadmium <laughs> which we were freaking out because we knew that was a toxic uh uh element and uh which son was that? Poison control. The Zach. youngest? Oh. Zach. <laughs> yeah, he <laughs> ate, he had literally ate paint as a kid. <laughs> but um but um so I know what it's like to have kids get into your stuff. You um and and making an organization, we finally had to kind of put a little we had to block that room off. And we had some furniture that we I would move in front of it so the so that the toddler mm -hmm. and then the next kid that was a baby couldn't crawl in there and get into to my paints and stuff right now i i'm only working digitally i have aspirations to paint in oils um in the near future uh, but i'm not doing that right now so this office is set up just i mean it's so easy because all i have is my computer and my wacom tablet so i don't yeah. have the i used to have that flat same flat file from makia it's great um, I just didn't feel like I needed it. So I, I sold that off. But, um, as far as organization, I'm basically iPad and, and computer digital. And I would, I would follow up with that. Will too. um, if, if you don't have a lot of space and you want to work digitally, um, I would recommend the iPad. Um, especially if you're, you're not doing anything necessarily going to print because iPad really doesn't have exporting capabilities to, to export files for print unless you do, you know, don't mind taking them over to your desktop if you have that and, mm -hmm. and can do them that way. But the iPad is the smallest device that can do the most coolest digital stuff on it. You get the, the, the pen, the Apple mm -hmm. pencil, whatever it is, and... Um, and this guy. It's perfect. Now the lit, I the did lit. this on the, the this little Tin Man behind me on. Yeah, and that's a iPad. huge. That's a huge print. I mean, didn't didn't the last version of Adobe Photoshop for the iPad, isn't that like a, almost a production level version of it? You should look into that. But I I know yeah maybe 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 that works just fine. But like for me when I'm doing print stuff. You know the I want to make sure the CMYK settings are are right and everything transitions into that because you don't want the publisher to handle that um, or the print shop to handle that i usually just i like to deliver all the files print ready mm -hmm. um, and i usually send them through i usually export them through indesign because indesign has some really good exporting um, capabilities that photoshop doesn't and i don't think indesign is on the ipad it might be i don't know but um the, the other thing too if you are working professionally Time-wise, nothing beats a keyboard at your side because of the hotkeys and just mm -hmm. the ease, you know, and a mouse when you need it, the stylus when you need it. But uh, it just makes it so much easier to, like, 
switch between tools and, and work fast and yeah. I do your... I do I do have this little keyboard that Bluetooths to the iPad. Mm-hmm. Yep. So you can do that and they work it works great. Yeah. It's still not I couldn't I couldn't do it without my desktop still. I yeah. wanna add so in so going back a step a little more generic generically, if people are wondering about their studios at home, the one essential ingredient that I think you have to have, aside from what tool, everybody's gonna have different tools and different things they're using for whatever art they're making, but a place that you can think and be alone, at least in spirit, (laughs) somehow isolate Mm -hmm. yourself from other people is gonna be the biggest thing. I think that's what students struggle with a lot is they try to do, like you said, Jake, the, the kitchen table one, but then their brothers and sisters are walking in and the and the mom's coming in to, and oh, what you what are you drawing? And you're always mm-hmm. just being sort of judged a little bit. I think you need to figure out something, even if it's even if it's making a tent in your garage and going drawing inside the tent, mm-hmm. somehow separating yourself so you have a space of your own um, to mm-hmm. create and to think. And because I mean, creating and being an illustrator is not like other jobs where you can just go and just start hammering it out. It always takes me a little while to get into it, and if I got people mm-hmm. talking to me it gets delayed and delayed. I mean, it's like 30 minutes in is when I start to feel like I'm making progress. Yeah, when you get in the flow. Um, yeah, and so just somehow, I mean, the, whatever studio, I've got, I have two studios right now and that presents its own problem because I got some stuff at one, some at the other. But the one thing that's, that's crucial is that I can isolate myself in, in, in either one of them where I've gone, I've been in situations where I'm like, well, and I have a small, super small space. I've had other times where I have a huge, almost warehouse size space and, and both of them work. Um, the other thing I want to say besides being isolated and being able to be by yourself is to try to keep your setup simple. Um, it's easy, especially in school when you're taking all these classes and teachers are requiring all these paints and all this stuff to get overwhelmed. Um, my whole setup is so easy to move and so easy to transport. I mean, even if I'm doing traditional art, like in watercolor, I only have six pigments that I use, six paints. I'm not hauling a huge thing of paint everywhere. Mm -hmm. I can travel um, easily and do full scale paintings because I've used only the essential things that I need and there's not a lot of, you know, extra super fancy technique. I try to use just like, my sketchbook is just a basic number two pencil or a mechanical pencil that you buy like at Staples. It's nothing fancy. Um, and so just keeping it simple means that you make a lot of work instead mm-hmm. of getting caught up in all that. Yeah. That, and, and I would add two noise canceling headphones <laughs> if, if you can, if you're in a position where you can afford it and things don't go to pot while you, um, while you are zoning, you know, in the zone. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend <laughs> these if you're taking that's, care of kids. That's a good way to have kids get a nice masterpiece painted with desitin. Right. <laughs> exactly. So, but these, these are great. Um, especially, you know, uh, when, when the kids are home from school and, and things are going, um, um, you know, a mile a minute in the background, I could put these on and, um, and stay in that, that creative zone, you know, especially if a project needs to get finished and you can't have distractions right then. But Lee's right. You get, you have a space to yourself. I would say have a time to yourself. So when the kids go to bed at night or get up super early before the kids get up um, or during nap time, if they're that age, um, or you bring in a nanny for a couple hours every day or your significant other takes care of the kids, but um, you need to have that space, that time to to be able to work on this stuff. And then also th- th- there's some um, guilt that comes with that, I think, as well, where you think, okay, I have my two hours now and I better have a productive two hours. I better come up with something brilliant. Don't get into that. What my advice there is, if you create something in two hours, that's great. That's a bonus. But just go into it thinking, this is my two hours to be in this space, or three hours, or whatever it is, um, to be in this this space. And if something gets created, good. If nothing happens, at least it's uh, at least I showed up, right? I showed up and I was there. And it's not about one day. It's not about one week of doing that. It's about uh, you know, a lifetime getting into that, that zone frequently, you know, 50 times and, and just chipping away at it 
out of those 50 times. And, and that's where you really are productive and where you really make something cool. That's great. That's really good. All right. We got one more. What do you think we got time to? Yeah, let's do it. To hit it. All right. This is from Kara. The subject heading is drawing the same things over and over and over. She says, I get bored very easily drawing the same thing over and over. I don't think I can manage to ever illustrate a whole children's book because of the repetition in characters and setting. Either how do I overcome this obstacle or what are my other options in illustration? Thank you. I love you, uh, Lee, but not Jake and Will. Okay. <laughs> she didn't really say it. She said she loves us all. Right, all right, then you answer it. <laughs> <laughs> well, A, I would say if I had to draw the same character, the, basically the same thing over and over, I would get bored too. If, and So that means you're probably not looking at the right story. I mean, you, when you read a story and you're going to illustrate a children's book, you should be dying to illustrate that story. Mm -hmm. um, there should be a, an arc that happens, and that means your character is either going to change over time, the setting's going to change over time, something is going to change from page one to page 32, mm -hmm. and it's your job to make that, that journey interesting. Um, now, if you really don't want to paint the same thing over and over, that's when what we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast, that's when you start to say, okay, I like to make singular images. What's the market for that? And there's, there's a bunch of markets for that, like editorial illustration. If you read any article online, could be news, could be politics, whatever, environmental stuff, um, you know, editorial illustration goes along with that. And so you're basically trying to visually sum up what the article is saying or show some kind of problem solution that the story is saying. And that's just a one hit thing. You don't have to have a character that goes, uh, you know, over and over for sequential spreads. You could do book covers and that's just a one hit. I, that's one of my favorite things to do is book covers. Um, because of that reason, you're not locked into a character and showing them from all sides and all that stuff. So, you know, it really becomes about just finding the market for the kind of work that you want to create. Mm -hmm. I really identify with this question because that was me for years and years and years where I was just like, if I spent time drawing a thing, you know, I got it out of my system and I never needed to really come back to that thing again. And that's why comic books scared me because I knew I'd have to like draw the characters, same character over and over. Children's books scared me because I knew for the same reason. Um, and essentially what happens as you get better and and as you become more mature, mature in your in your work is it's less about it's less energy, less creative energy to actually make something. Um, uh, you, you sort of get shortcuts or you understand how things work. And a lot of your creative, creative energy is taken from the actual creation of the object to the more mature you get with, with, uh, with your work to that creative energy is more in the idea making and, and seeing what you could do with, with that, you know, with that character. And it's less about, oh, is the lighting right? Or, oh, is this pose right? You know, and, and that stuff that, that takes a lot of energy and thought and time when you're first starting out and it's, and it's exhausting. And so you, you, the more you draw, the more you will get into this headspace of, you could finish a drawing, look at it and crumple it up and throw it away and not have any bad feelings about it and my my um you know my thought is that at this stage in your career because i remember being at that stage where every drawing was precious you know every drawing took so much out of me that i didn't want to like do anything <laughs> do anything to, to compromise it and now i'm at this stage where if i screw something up or if ink falls you know spills over an image oh well that image took two hours to do i've got another two hours i'll just you know I, I, I'll, I'll knock it out again, something like that. So, um, and so I think that's, that's essentially, you're at this, this sort of this early stages of, of art where you, you just have to get through so many drawings to where you're comfortable with and used to drawing some of the things over and over in concept art, you're going to do revision after revision, after revision in illustration, even if it's just spot illustrations for magazines or, or for websites or whatever, you know, there's going to be the, the, the editors or the art director is going to say, okay, you know, we need 
five ideas or 10 ideas, and then we'll pick one. And so that's essentially you doing the same thing with little variations over and over, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's just, I think it's something you're just going to have to get used to. Um, And I like Lee's answer in that if you're doing it right, like a comic book or a children's book, it really isn't the same drawing over and over. You're going to be doing the same character in different poses, in different situations, different lighting. Um, All these offer unique opportunities and and chances to kind of push yourself and and be creative in different ways. So Mm -hmm. I'd say just stick to it. Keep drawing. Keep practicing. Will, did you have anything? Yeah, I mean, you guys pretty much nailed it, but the the whole thing of creativity comes in if if you feel like, you know, there there have been books that I've done where I felt like I was doing the same illustration, and luckily I had art directors that, that caught it, and they're like, uh, on page 9, looks almost identical to page 15. <laughs> um, you know, like, what could you do to mix it up? And when I looked at them, I'm like, gah, I just did the same illustration, and this was way back. Mm-hmm. You know, and now when I lay out my, my, uh, uh, my, well, my, my thumbnail layouts, I'm looking for, is every illustration very different from the next? Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, uh, that's one thing. The other thing, again, like you kind of said, Lee, was if you don't like the character and you're struggling to get through it once, yeah, you're not going to want to do it multiple times. So you have to. When I fall in love with a character, like like the the Bonaparte books that I've been working on, I you know I love drawing that character from different angles. Mm-hmm. Um, this it's just fun, but I also like doing one offs because the thing, I mean, it, to me the appeal of a one off is you don't have to worry about any character consistency. You get <laughs> to get in and design in a dynamic piece, and you don't have to worry about following it up with others. So. That's that's a fun thing to do to get it to do a book cover. Yeah. 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 I'll add one more thing to this too, that if you do struggle with drawing the same thing over and over, start to look for some of the techniques they use in maybe animation. Like I do this a lot for my children's books now. Um, I, I always think that drawing a character in, you know, a children's book might take you know, four or five months to put together. So draw a character in December, and then I'm drawing the same character in May, might lose some continuity or I get better at the character or whatever. So what I do now is I just make a couple of character sheets. I just draw the character in a bunch of different poses that they might be in the book. Doesn't have to be exact, but um, but I drew a bunch of heads from different angles, the body, and, and, and then a bunch of just different poses or whatever. And then as I'm making the actual art, I literally copy and paste the character into where it <laughs> needs to be. And I make sure it's big enough to where I can have them big on one full page. That way I can always shrink them down. And you're just like kind of, yeah, you know, I can grab a head from over here and a body from over here and it's I mean, it's like 90% of the pose is almost done and it's all drawn at the same time. And so it's Mm -hmm. very consistent. That's so smart. Yep. Cool. Well, four questions in one podcast episode. I think that's a new record. (laughs) Good job, guys. Love it. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for for joining us today. We we really, really appreciate it. And we love that, um, that you guys like this, this, uh, this podcast because we enjoy making it and we love all the good feedback that we've been getting. So three point, three point perspective is made possible by svslearn.com where becoming a great illustrator starts. Uh, and your hosts today have been Will Terry. You can find him at on Instagram at Will Terry art and his website is willterry.com. Lee White, his website is leewhiteillustration.com and his uh, Instagram account is at leewhiteillo. And I'm Jake Parker. My website's mrjakeparker.com and you can find me on Instagram at Jake Parker. Podcast produced by Daniel Tu. That's danieltu.co is his website. Go check him out there. He's a good filmmaker um, and uh, videographer and, and he does bunch of cool stuff so uh check out check out his stuff special thanks to our svs production manager david bro uh always helping us behind the scenes here uh, grateful for him and thank you to our social media specialist lisa fott she does a great job getting the word out everything that we're doing here so thank you for that all right uh if you like this episode share it around uh podcasts live and die by word of mouth and so we we would love it if you just um uh let people know 
what's going on here. We'd love to hear what you think as well. So leave a review wherever it is you you do listen to podcasts. And if you're wanting to enjoy, I mean, join in on this uh, discussion, this particular discussion, go to our svslearn.com forums and you click on the uh, forum link at the top of svslearn.com and there is a um, a thread devoted to this topic. So if you take issue with anything or if you th- thought of something that we didn't bring up uh, or you just have a different perspective, go ahead and, and just uh, reply there. And uh, there's always a good discussion happening over there. So we'd love to hear what you think. And I think that is it. Um, for everybody. Thank you. And, and we hope to see you next time.